for sending me that. Um, so I will start uh, right away. As I said, maybe I'm falling a little bit or this talk is falling a little bit out of the picture because it is about uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and uh, type 2 diabetes and especially, of course, the approach uh, uh, to those um, conditions coexisting in primary care. But we will see in a moment that this is very much so related to uh, chronic kidney disease in primary care as well from uh, some uh, epidemiological uh, data. Uh, so this is the outline of uh, my presentation and our respected chairman already alluded to that. So I will um, directly go into medias res in uh, order not to uh, lose much time. Um, actually, uh, we know uh, that uh, the epidemiology of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and um, even NASH, so the uh, advanced form and irreversible fibrotic form is um, quite uh, prevalent and uh, in western countries it's actually the most uh, prevalent uh, liver disease with uh, prevalences between 30 and 40 percent and even in primary care where we have actually a low prevalence uh, population which is very similar um, in terms of epidemiological characteristics with the general population even there uh, the prevalence has been given uh, um, close to 20%, which is quite high for primary care. And uh, the bad thing about um, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or liver disease in, in general is that it is insidious, asymptomatic. So very much so like uh, chronic kidney disease. So very similar uh, clinical presentations or let's say non-presentations in the um, uh, early stages, which is bad and which uh, requires uh, screening. So there uh, would be where primary care comes in because screening is uh, the uh, uh, best uh, actually example for secondary prevention, prevention being uh, one of the main pillar tasks of uh, primary, uh, primary care and uh, general practice, as you know. And if we look at the coexistence of um, uh, non-alcoholic fa fatty liver disease and uh, diabetes, uh, we know uh, that there's a high um, uh, level of coexistence over 55% uh, have been given in, in uh, some studies. And um, uh, the bad thing is uh, even the stages of advanced fibrosis are quite high. So 17%, nearly um, uh, 20 uh, and the global prevalence of the association of uh, NASH and type 2 diabetes has been um, estimated as high as 37%, 37 something, so nearly 40%. And uh, Europe uh, being number one there with the highest prevalence of 68% um, uh, contributing, uh, you know, uh, with the highest weightening actually to this global uh, um, uh, percentage of nearly 40%. And uh, the uh, predictors have been uh, actually uh, shown to be um, geographic region, uh, as we can see uh, that uh, Europe had, had quite a high um, uh, coexistence and was uh, contributing highly to this global prevalence and mean age. So mean age is something we unfortunately can can't do anything about. So a classical non-modifiable risk factor, sex age, uh, as you know, um, and geographic re uh, region also, but geographic region would be alluding to, of course, lifestyle. So what we eat, what we drink, and how much we move, uh, uh, that all has to do with culture. And that all, again, as we know, is associated to um, the society we live in, we which again is associated to where we live on this planet. 
Uh, yeah, and um, going along uh, now, um, uh, I, I said that I, I would try to put uh, this uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease talk a little bit into context of the uh, chronic kidney disease topic of this session. Um, uh, we know uh, that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, independent of its coexistence with diabetes, is actually a driver or a predictor of um chronic kidney disease. Uh, and this is quite a recent review, actually, from uh, 2020. And um, here it says that uh, independent of these, um, you know, aggravating metabolic conditions like type 2 diabetes, unhealthy diets, and so on, um, the epidemiological evidence uh, suggests uh, more and more heavily that uh, non-alcoholic non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is an independent risk factor for chronic uh, kidney disease. So it is preceding um, uh, the um, uh, development of chronic kidney disease. And here, um, uh, this is a study, this is not um, a review, but it's an uh, observational study where, uh, you know, type 2 diabetic uh, individuals were followed up um, and um, they saw uh, that um, uh, type 2 diabetic individuals with normal or near normal uh, kidney function uh, were uh, followed up um, uh, for the occurrence of um, uh, chronic kidney disease. And uh, then uh, at the end, they um, could conclude that uh, NFADL is associated with an increased incidence of chronic kidney disease in individuals with type 2 uh, diabetes, which was actually independent of uh, some baseline confounding factors like age and sex and diabetes duration and um, other comorbidities. So uh, we know now uh, putting things into a uh, picture that the condition I'm going to talk about, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and type 2 diabetes, is actually a risk factor preceding the development of chronic kidney disease. So putting it into context with the following talks. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, I already mentioned that uh, risk factors um, have to be first, of course, uh, divided by modifiable versus non uh, modifiable, uh, but uh, we know um, that uh, the uh, whole, uh, you know, obesity and uh, insulin resistance and metabolic cluster is a, a known uh, risk factor for um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And um, uh, also, of course, uh, family uh, history uh, of, of uh, cardiometabolic disorders. Uh, and uh, we know uh, that these conditions uh, rely heavily also uh, to, uh, on exposure to unhealthy lifestyles. So there's a lot we can do to uh, prevent these. Um, so uh, primary prevention is possible uh, by avoiding avoiding exposure to uh, these unhealthy lifestyle conditions uh, with uh, actually a healthy lifestyle. But the bad thing about, uh, let's not say bad, bad is a bad word, uh, but uh, the tricky thing about healthy lifestyle uh, actually is that it's very hard for people to um, change uh, their habits, so adopt another uh, lifestyle. And uh, even uh, so, if they did, it's even harder to maintain and sustain this. So that is the downside of lifestyle interventions. Actually, on a biological point of view, they're very safe because we don't do any interventions. We don't even use any drugs. But um, uh, it's hard to educate life prof uh, healthcare professionals. It's even harder for those healthcare professionals to motivate our patients. It's hard for our patients to change, um, to adopt healthy lifestyle, and it's it's even uh, more 
difficult to sustain this for a lifetime. So that's the downside of healthy lifestyle. Otherwise, it's perfect. Um, and uh, for secondary prevention, as I said, uh, the um, uh, very good example uh, of secondary prevention would be screening. So um, uh, there is uh, in all uh, guidelines actually a uniform um, recommendation against screening the general population uh, for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, yeah, and uh, remember I was talking about the fact that lifestyle actually is a very good um, way to prevent uh, uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And here we see the um, uh, different lifestyle trials. Uh, actually, uh, they are uh, effective, but the downside, as I said, would be the sustainability of effect, uh, very similar as it is uh, actually with uh, the um, case of type 2 diabetes and healthy lifestyle. Um, and um, yeah, lifestyle modification, it says in the literature, should remain the primary focus for all uh, patients um, uh, to uh, prevent and manage non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But there's a lot uh, we still need to know. Uh, first of all, um, does the baseline stage of fibrosis, so how advanced is uh, the patient in the uh, hepatic um uh, you know, pathology, does this influence uh, the efficacy of lifestyle interventions? And if so, which would be the best fit for, for which patient? And um, uh, we, we also know, yeah, that's what I already said, that actually, if lifestyle were a little bit more easy to use, user-friendly and feasible, uh, it would actually uh, surpass, uh, surpass uh, efficacy of uh, drugs uh, currently um, being evaluated for uh, the uh, prevention of uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But as I said, uh, we need all the weapons we have. Um, so as I said, um, uh, screening of the general population is not uh, recommended. And for primary care, actually, uh, you know that uh, we uh, in primary care actually work with um, excluding uh, conditions and uh, we uh, prefer non-invasive point of care testing. And there is actually a lot of, uh, except for uh, screening um, our patients according to their individual uh, risks, there are um, composite risk scores, you know, uh, uh, for uh, advanced fibrosis, which has been uh, which have been validated uh, against gold standards of um, uh, diagnosis for uh, conditions like NAFDL and NASH. Uh, and all societies for the time being uh, uh, recommend against systematic screening of the general population for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. But uh, people with type di uh, 2 diabetes, and that is again conform uh, with many societies, uh, with many guidelines uh, of different societies, uh, are uh, in the index of high suspicion. So if somebody is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, it makes sense to screen them or also for the um, condition of um, non-alcoholic fatty uh, liver uh, disease. Again, here we see the diabetes, uh, the European guideline, they say risk groups uh, like diabetes and uh, obesity. But uh, the point for, from primary care is that there are no primary care specific guideline recommendations and that uh, the recommendations in general are not very consistent, but that 
there's no guidance for primary care. And I said it's important because of the screening and because of the um, tests, uh, these point of care and if possible, non-invasive tests that uh, we prefer to use in primary care. So uh, this is something we need to do research on. Further research should be directed um, to that. Yeah, that uh, these are, uh, you know, the screening recommendations from the different guidelines uh, plotted against each other. And for primary care, uh, these uh, first through, uh, three lines would be uh, relevant. Here you see non-invasive tests uh, for, for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And even for the stage of fibrosis of NASH, the advanced form, are uh, available for primary care, but they're not universally introduced. So that's why we would need a primary care guideline. Um, and uh, for um, the, the approach to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in primary care, actually there are recommendations. There's this three-step uh, recommendation, uh, which uh, although uh, in the general um, uh, recommendations of related guidelines, we know uh, that uh, liver enzymes uh, are and ultrasound are no screening tests for this condition. For primary care, it says uh, the first step could be, uh, should be um, liver enzymes and or ultrasound. Uh, and then uh, we could employ one of those um, composite risk scores, this clinical prediction rule. Uh, as I already said. And in many countries, we do have ultrasound imaging as point of care testing in primary care. So if uh, present, imaging could also uh, be used. And then uh, according to the results, uh, the uh, third step would be, of course, to refer patients uh, with advanced fibrosis or, or uh, the suspicion of advanced fibrosis to secondary care specialists. And that's this algorithm. So I won't go uh, too much into detail into that. Um, yeah, and about, uh, you know, although we don't have any specific uh, primary care guidelines for the uh, management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and especially more so uh, of this condition in people with type 2 diabetes, we know from uh, research evidence that the awareness about this condition, uh, so the fatty liver disease in primary care is quite low. So um, first of all, the first thing to do is to create an awareness of uh, the high um, a multimorbid coexistence uh, of non-alcoholic uh, alcoholic fatty liver disease with type 2 diabetes. And in the context of this session, again, that it is um, a procedure and a risk factor for chronic kidney disease in people with type 2 diabetes. And about the drug ter therapy, I won't go into that, but... Um, we know that uh, for uh, uh, NAFDL, pioglitazone uh, is um, in use and uh, now SGLT2s and GLP-1 receptor agonists uh, are also um, recommended. But again, for instance, a NICE guideline does not recommend to initiate these um, uh, therapies for uh, the management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NASH in primary care. Uh, so the facet of all this, primary care can do a lot and much, much more about uh, the um, uh, prevention and management of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with uh, people um, with type 2 diabetes and thus the prevention of uh, NASH. And uh, actually, I won't go into that because that, that, that will just take us too long. But there's this uh, new um, concept of uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease, which is um, a larger entity than non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, 
because it includes actually also uh, the uh, fatty liver induced by uh, alcohol. So that would be the umbrella term. And there are, um, that's quite recent. I think it was um, postulated in 2020. And uh, there are some epidemiological uh, prediction studies now um, published in 21. But because this is a non-exclusive term, you know, in primary care, as I said, we have the, this low prevalence population. So we need to be very uh, comprehensive and non-exclusive in our um, uh, disease um, definitions. And that is why this uh, metabolic associated fatty liver concept would be a good approach for primary care. And if we now go for primary care guidelines for the uh, management, prevention and management of uh, NAFDL uh, in type 2 diabetes, we should um, consider this new concept uh, as well. Uh, and one of the main barriers that uh, everybody, all of us, all clinicians who look after type 2 diabetic patients um, uh, encounter and uh, know well is actually that this um, uh, sedentary lifestyle, which is the cause of all ev evil, so to say, because it's a modifiable risk factor uh, that if uh, the exposure is avoided, would uh, actually uh, mean pri primary prevention of uh, obesity and all the uh, dysglycemic career steps which uh, follow uh, hence. Uh, but this condition is commu community dwelling more, much more more so, unfortunately, now uh, with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So again, here we need primary care with proactive outreach to each individual in the community of the GP. So one last word, what happened during uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, as I said in the previous slide, as I mentioned, first of all, we all uh, became much more sedentary due to the lockdowns uh, and um, uh, a lot of people uh, put on weight, uh, which is of course deleterious for people who are overweight, obese, type two diabetic, uh, have fatty liver and so on. Uh, and we also know in terms of um, uh, provision of healthcare and provision of primary care and preventive care, that this hegemony of the uh, uh, communic communicable disease and in that only of SARS-CoV-2 led to uh, great uh, shortfalls and a lot of missed opportunities in terms of uh, prevention and care um, and follow-up of chronic diseases. And uh, for instance, this is a study from the UK, very alarming. We, we know that in the UK, there are nearly 60,000 uh, missed or delayed uh, diagnosis for type 2 diabetes, and the diabetes mortality increased twofold between uh, March and December uh, 2020. So this hegemony of the acute, acute and the hegemony of this um, uh, infectious disease uh, has led to uh, also shortfalls uh, in the care for our uh, patients with type 2 diabetes. And it's not only us who can do uh, something, uh, also patients should be proactive. And uh, we know uh, that in all healthcare systems, primary care actually is a guarantee for equity, so for accessible health care and integration of care, so an unfragmented, unfragmented patient journey uh, is uh, the key for quality of care, one of the keys, and thus um, exploiting uh, primary care and uh, the community resources uh, it can reach out easily to uh, would be a wonderful way of implementing, you know, these new approaches to chronic care models for um, uh, preventing and managing uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease uh, in type 2 diabetes in uh, primary care or in the community. Yeah, and that was actually the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.